um, some background about network and visualization or analysis, and uh, and then talk about a particular type of pathway analysis visualization called enrichment map that was used to make that autism network that I showed on the first uh, yesterday morning. Um, and we'll also go over Cytoscape, um, which, which most of you, are, everyone's familiar with now. Um, the reason why we have some intro, still some intro material that we're giving is that we felt that it, it's in general better to um, get you started, and actually I think this was based on feedback from previous classes, it's better to just get you started with getting your hands wet with lots of different stuff rather than spend a whole day going over concepts and then only at the end going over um, you know, actual tools. So we put more tools in the beginning even though we didn't go over all the concepts and we'll fill in some of the concepts afterwards. So now you actually have, you've actually used networks and looked at networks um, and so some of these concepts will be partially familiar but we'll just go through them to uh, round out the um, conceptual aspects of the lectures. <coughs> okay, so just to summarize uh, or come back to uh, what we've been talking about in this in this course that there's sort of a, a, a general network analysis workflow um, uh, just we I showed this yesterday and so I think everybody's um, seen this now and um, and what we've learned yesterday and this morning um, are you know aspects about uh, figuring out how um, you know, interesting areas of network so for instance looking at modules, taking your gene list and converting into a network with React OMFI and then identifying modules and doing pathway enrichment analysis on those modules. That's, that's a little workflow within here um, that helps you identify interesting path networks in this case. And then you can look at genes and go out to React Dome and, and drill down to um, understand molecular mechanism. Um, this little image is updated from an older version that was published previously. Um, so I think um, uh, this, this paper, Integration of Biological Networks and Gene Expression Data Using Cytoscape, is still valuable, although it's, it's much older now. Um, it still talks about different aspects of the this, this same workflow. Um, okay, so uh, Lincoln also uh, mentioned some of this, um, but uh, there's, and, and um, I just wanted to go over again very fairly quickly, the, um, uh, again, to fill in some gaps, the, um, background about, about networks. So networks in general represent relationships. Um, in, 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 in biology, those relationships are often physical, regulatory, genetic, or functional. So physical relationships are protein-protein interactions. Regulatory relationships are uh, you know, transcription factor, target. Usually there's an arrow there. Uh, genetic interactions are um, often more often found in model organism research where you have a logical relationship between two genes in terms of genotype and phenotype. So if you have, uh, for instance, gene A that you knock it out and nothing happens, gene A, gene B, you knock it out and nothing happens, you knock them both out together and the cell can't survive, that's a synthetic lethal genetic interaction. And there's a lot of uh, discussion about genetic interactions where you have, um, you know, even in, in, in any kind of field of genetics. Um, functional interactions are more general. They are <coughs> any kind of interaction that can be used to help relate the function of two genes um, or proteins. So um, they are, uh, a w there's a wide variety. For instance, if two proteins are, have similar sequence, uh, similar sequences, they might have similar function. If they have similar expression profiles over many experiments, they might have similar function. So any type of pattern that relates genes uh, that where you can say, you know, they might have similar function is a functional interaction. And the, you know, Reactome FI functional interaction is, that network is, fil is composed of functional interactions, um, which are themselves combined for many other types of relationships. Um, so networks in general are, are useful for, you know, why, why do we actually bother with networks? Um, one, they're useful for discovering relationships in large data sets, so they're much more easy to use than finding relationships in tables, which is what you would have to do if you didn't have this idea of a network. Um, they're very useful for visualizing multiple types of data together. So you can have a network and then overlay different types of information on that, and you can see how they're related. Uh, and, and of course, for network analysis. And um, this is an example from the pre-reading that we sent out, uh, the primer on network 
of how to interpret biological networks, um, where we have a lot of different information overlaid on this network, um, and that's that's useful. So we'll come back to this uh, later. Um, I think Lincoln mentioned the difference between pathways and networks as well. Um, my take on it is that is that uh, pathways are networks. They just have a lot more detail, and often that detail is related to um, uh, there could actually be different types of details, so you could have a metabolic pathway where it's really important to have steps that are transitioning between metabolites. You can have a regulatory pathway where it's really important for uh, to kind of think about the logical circuits of the cell, how one part of the cell is controlling another part of the cell, um, and, uh, and signaling pathways which um, uh, talk about information flow, so they represent that information. So there's actually lots of different ways of representing pathways. Um, and, and there's, there's no real definition, official definition of a pathway. Um, one way of thinking about it is that it's sort of general definition is that it's any gene that's related to a process. So how could you figure that out? You have a way of starting, stimulating a process and a way of reading out a process. So maybe you have a drug that you put on a cell and that activates a receptor and some pathway occurs and then a gene gets expressed. So you can read out, you can check that the gene's expressed and you can control the activation of the pathway. And then if you knock out genes in the system, any gene that affects that transition, that changes the ability for that signal to go through, is part of the pathway. So that's one way of thinking about it. Um, metabolic pathways are more biochemically oriented. Um, they might think about flux of material through a system where you're really just talking about channels of, you know, major channels of material flowing through the cell. Um, <coughs> But, uh, and I'm sure many people here know this, but the, um, um, sometimes people ask, you know, what actually is the official definition of the pathway, and there's no real very specific definition. Um, so network analysis, um, you know, on, on the one hand, networks are useful for seeing relationships and visualizing data, but the most powerful reason why people have gotten excited about networks in biology is that there is a large... Uh, amount of work that's been done with network analysis in other fields. And um, in computer science, network analysis is being used for, and math, network analysis is being discussed for more than 100 years. Um, people didn't call it network analysis, they called it graph theory. Um, so many, some people may have heard that term. So computer scientists and math call networks, and math mathematicians call networks graphs. Um, that's confusing, so we didn't use that most people, when you ask, when you say graph, they think plot. So we don't use that terminology in biology. We say network because it's more intuitive. Um, but at the same time, we can go look at graph theory and see all the algorithms that have been developed over more than a century. And um, and some of those might be useful for biology. And so uh, in the beginning of this network analysis field, people looked to graph theory and they said, oh, I have all these biological questions. I can just take all these algorithms from computer science and they answer my question. I don't have to develop anything new. And that was extremely powerful and lots of computer scientists came up with all sorts of interesting ideas for solving biological problems. And a lot of those are used in the tools that we are using today, like uh, the Reactome FI system that finds the modules. That system that finds the modules is a network clustering system that people have been working on network clustering for a long time and now when you want to do that in biology to find modules, you just choose one of the 1,000 different algorithms, at least, that exist to do that, and they chose one that worked well and was fast. Um, so you don't have to develop it ourselves. Um, so here's an example of how this, w how this works, a very simple example. How many people have heard of six degrees of separation, this idea of six degrees of separation? So this is, this is the idea for people who haven't heard uh, that everybody in the world is connected by at least six hops in, uh, in terms of friendship to everyone else. I'm sure this was developed in the 60s. I'm sure it's like two or three now with Facebook. Um, <coughs> but um, the, the, it's an interesting idea. The person who came up with this idea was uh, a sociologist named Stanley Milgram who did an exp wanted to learn about social networks and did an experiment where he took postcards and he gave them to people in Boston and he said, send them to this person in New York. You have the person's name and what they do, but you don't have their address, and you're not allowed to use any, you're not allowed to look up any information about them. You just have to 
use your friend network and send the postcards through your friends to see if it eventually will get to them. And half the postcards got to the, to the person. Um, and each time a postcard was sent, he, he um, asked the people to send a postcard to him so he could track where they were going. And in the end, he realized that it was six. To, it took like on average six steps before before it got to the right person. So that was re that was really interesting. Um, if you you know, now we have this Facebook network, so you have it all on the computer. Um, if you wanted to do that same experiment, you wanted to know how two people are connected. What could you do? Uh, which path would you take? So it turns out that computer science have solved all these problems for how to search these networks and find paths between people. And for instance, there's an algorithm called shortest path by breadth first search. So it, it searches from a node outwards until it reaches all other nodes. And then eventually it will tell you that this is the shortest path. And the good thing about that algorithm is that it's mathematically proven to guarantee, it will, has a couple of guarantees. One, it's guaranteed to find a path of it if it exists. And it's also guaranteed to give you a shortest path. There might be more than one shortest path, but you will guarantee get the shortest path. So that's interesting. So that's a standard algorithm. Every undergraduate in computer science learns it. Um, if you were interested in, if you had this giant biological network and you wanted to know how two proteins are connected, you could just apply that algorithm and find that path. Now, um, is that biologically relevant? It's definitely a solution from, from computer science, but that path is the shortest path. Does that mean anything in biology? Um, maybe it means something interesting. Maybe it's not, it doesn't consider some important aspects of biology. So um, we do have to be careful when we're thinking about, when we're moving you know, algorithms from computer science over to biology. Whenever you learn, whenever you're using network analysis, if you um, eventually use it enough, you can identify sort of these core um, algorithms that, that are used over and over again and just be aware of what's missing what they're not uh, talking about. So we talk, we, you've, you've seen a few already, um, the, um, and you'll see more uh, later. Um, but uh, network analysis is useful for all sorts of things. It's, so basically, a number of algorithms from, from computer science have been ported over, or brought over, plus a lot of new algorithms have been, been developed in computational biology to do all sorts of, answer all sorts of interesting questions predict the function of a gene, um, find modular structures, which could be protein complexes or pathways, um, study network evolution. So if, you're, if you have networks from different species, there are alignment algorithms for networks, just like there are alignment algorithms like BLAST for, for protein sequences. Um, predicting new protein interactions or interactions. So one of the ideas is um, you find a, a region of the network where almost everything is connected. Um, so maybe everything should be connected, so those additional connections you can fill in. Um, and maybe that's predicting new interactions. That's one idea, but there, there are many ideas like that. Um, there are also a lot of um, app, uh, network uh, applications of, of network analysis that are applied to disease. Um, so um, people have, have published papers about identifying disease-specific subnetworks. So, um, that, are, that, that, that could be networks that are transcriptionally active in your cases versus your controls or your experiment versus your, your, um, your control. Um, people have used networks to, for, for diagnosis. Um, and I mentioned this briefly yesterday morning. Um, there have been a couple of papers that are, are, are quite highly cited now where um, instead of looking at genes to associate with, um, in this case, it was breast cancer metastasis, um, they used networks and they searched for networks that were so where the gene expression, the networks contained proteins that were connected and their gene ex and they were all differentially expressed and they were correlated with outcome in this breast cancer study. So um, all those three things together were searched at once and these networks came out and, um, and they actually overlapped a lot better than the individual gene signatures. That's what I was mentioning early yesterday. Um, um, and uh, similarly, people have applied this to, to GWAS studies as, as well. Okay, so there was a question about this yesterday, and, and I'm sure you guys have been thinking about this, about what's missing in, in networks and pathways. So we, we mentioned yesterday in response to a question that um, pathways and networks basically don't have any context. They're representing 
static process. They're they're representing dynamic processes as static networks. So you, you you're not seeing an animation of a process when you're looking at a network or a pathway. You see a textbook like picture, um, and and it doesn't uh, represent. So that's that's missing. I mentioned yesterday morning that one place to get that information is your own experiments. So you your own experiments are providing important context. Um, it's also only useful for representing a certain part of what we understand about how the cell works. So a feedback loop is not easily represented. A calcium wave in a neuron is not basically is impossible to represent with networks and, and pathways. Um, a typical representation, and you know a lot of a lot of things that we know occur in the cell just don't show up on these pathway diagrams. So um, there are more detailed modeling representations that exist. So if you ever need to do this, we're not going to cover it here, but people have uh, developed a huge field of work to help simulate pathways. Uh, and if you know a lot about a pathway, you can predict all sorts of things about it, like what happens if I knock out this gene? What's going to happen to anything else in the pathway? Um, um, a lot of detail is missing um, from the protein structures as well. Uh, so we know a lot of detail about atomic structure of proteins and uh, proteins are made up of domains and they have binding sites and none of that is really discussed. Um, and, and I mentioned context. Okay, so just to quickly summarize, um, I think everyone understands that networks are, are useful for uh, a wide range of, of ideas and there are many, many tools available. Um, for, for network analysis. Um, and um, I think I mentioned this later, but just mention it now. There is a, um, um, yeah, so, so because there are so many methods available, um, if you go to the Cytoscape app store, which I'll mention, I think there's 200 apps now, or more than 200 apps. Um, each one of those represents pretty much a method that somebody's developed. And that's not all the methods that have been published. So how do you know um, what method to use for your problem. So in this course, we're teaching you major classes where we of, of methods where we highlight the most useful and user-friendly tool in our opinion. Um, and so that might actually be fine for you for anything that you do. Um, uh, however, if you come across something that you want to do that's not covered by that, there are two ways of of dealing with it. One is obviously you can become an expert in everything, but that's not feasible for unless you're really getting into the, the area. Um, the other way is just asking experts. So um, you can ask us in this course, uh, anybody, um, that's a good opportunity to, to do that. Uh, and there are also uh, mailing lists, um, including for network analysis, the Cytoscape discussion mailing list is particularly useful. If you have a question, you know, I want to do this. I want to answer this biological question. Here's my experiment. Is there some way that I can do this? And in relation to Cytoscape, at least, people will answer if there's an app available. You can also go to the App Store and see what the popular apps are, or just look for publications. If you're looking through data and you look at publications, then you go to Google Scholar and see how many people have cited the publication. That's usually a good, a good indication that um, something is working well. OK, any questions? OK. So again, this is this is basic. This is a figure from the from the pre-reading. Um, hopefully, everybody did the pre-reading. To um, um, this just just reminds everybody that there's uh, different ways of thinking about a network. So often, in a if you're representing a network as a, in a spreadsheet, you'll have a, a set of relationships that are just um, you know two columns, usually gene A connected to gene B, um, and going down those columns. Um, sometimes you can have a score associated with that, like an interaction strength. Um, this is the sort of standard way of representing networks. And uh, you can also represent networks as a, as a heat map, um, where, uh, which we don't really cover that much, but is, is uh, maybe useful. So the reason why people would represent, use one of these versus the other, if they're sending a file, like a network file, and you, you would need to represent it in a table, um, the, it would be represented like this. Uh, this is how we prefer to visualize networks. But if the networks are really, really, really strongly connected, or everything's connected to everything else, this visualization breaks down. You can't really see anything after there's so many, once there's too many edges in the, um, in the network. And so in that case, a heat map visualization is, is much better. 
um, because it's it's using all the space. It's, it, there's no possible conflict between um, edges that are all crossing over each other. Um, Network uh, visualization is, is really dependent on, on automatic network layout, so we'll talk about that. Um, if you didn't have network layout algorithms, which again are something that was taken from, stolen from, com from, com from computer science, um, then you, when you draw a network, it would look like this mess, but then once you apply a layout algorithm, it, it looks a lot nicer and you can see structure. Um, so that's, that's very important. So the, just a practical, they're, they're actually, there are also many, many different layout algorithms, and um, in the lab, I urge you to just try all of the different ones out that are in Cytoscape. Um, the major class of network layout algorithms that people tend to use first is called force directed, and the way it works is it um, sets up a, a system where nodes are repelling each other, so there's some force pushing nodes apart. Usually, it's based on physics and the forces will be like charges or something, and you know if you put two magnets of the same uh, pole together, they'll repel. So that the physical formulas that are that model those processes are usually embedded in these algorithms, um, and then edges are usually pulling the nodes together. So you have this tension between edges pulling nodes together and nodes pulling each other, pushing each other apart. So the edges pulling are usually represented as springs. The reason why you want nodes to repel each other is because you don't want all the nodes overlap, overlapping on top of each other. And the reason why you want edges to pull is because you want things that are closely connected to be close to each other in the network. So here, for instance, all of these guys are highly connected and they're all close to each other. And so we can see this nice blue region here, whereas here they're just all over the place. So this is, you know, these blue guys have been pulled together because they're connected to each other. There's a lot of forces pulling them together. Um, so force-directed layout is definitely the first thing that you should probably try with any, any network in general. It's good for up to a certain size of, of network, um, 500 nodes. Uh, bigger networks give, um, you have problems. Um, as I mentioned, you get a, a hairball uh, where there's too many, if you have too many edges, you'll just get a lot of edge crossing and you won't be able to see it. And how many people have seen this already? And, their Reactome FI trials. Okay. So um, if that ever happens, uh, practical advice is to um, reduce the number of edges somehow. So for Reactome FI, I think um, every edge is associated with a, a confidence value. Um, and I, I don't know if you guys go over this in the, in the documentation. If there's too many edges that come back, you can reduce that. You can filter and remove lower confidence edges. Do you, do you guys do that? Yeah, so that's probably not that big of an issue with Reactome FI, but in general, if you're working with networks, you'll see in Gene Mania that sometimes the networks get really big. Um, and uh, and there are also other types of network layout algorithms. If you happen to be working with a network that is more like a tree, like you're working with a pedigree uh, or a phylogenetic tree, then there are specific layout algorithms that lay, lay that out hierarchically. And um, and generally, you need to do extra work to get a publication quality version of a network. You um, should not just rely on the network layout algorithm um, because it's not perfect. So um, if, if you want to get basically get a publication quality figure, you should do two things. One, you should manually adjust the layout so that everything's not overlapping. Um, two, you should load, you should save the network as a PDF. Um, a vector graphic, um, which is PDF, um, and then load it into a, a, a drawing program like Adobe Illustrator or CorelDRAW, and there's, there's free versions of that as well. Um, and then adjust things so that you can um, emphasize certain things, like you might, some of the labels might be overlapping, so you can move them around. You can add, um, add um, bubbles or arrows or color things appropriately, and that's if you, if you take care to do that, you'll get a much better looking network than you just print out whatever comes out of Cytoscape. Um, okay, so um, in, please interrupt me with questions. Usually, actually, one thing I forgot to add to the slides, people often ask a question, what is the meaning of the, of the length of the edges when you, of the length of these edges when you um, run a network layout algorithm? Um, that, that 
doesn't have any biological meaning. It's only the length of the, of the interaction is set to basically where the nodes are positioned after running the, the network, the layout algorithm in general. So if you have a long connection or a short connection, they're all, they're all considered the same by the, the layout algorithm, the standard layout algorithms. There are versions of the layout algorithms that are also available in Cytoscape if you want to have the length of that edge relating to a, a confidence value that you have on the, on the connections, you can have an edge-weighted uh, force-directed layout, and it will consider those, those weights, and, and shorter edges will be stronger edges, and longer edges will be weaker edges, weaker interactions. You can adjust the layout. Um, if you want to maintain that in your figure, then you have to be careful when you're adjusting the layout. Um, but usually the adjustments that are needed are fine-tuning adjustments. To The biggest problem when you're visualizing data is that you have um, visualizing networks is that there's overlap. So you want to reduce that overlap. So nodes and labels shouldn't overlap each other, otherwise you can't see something. And the other big problem is edges that cross. So the layout algorithm is trying to remove as many edge crossings as it can, um, but it, it can't remove it. It's impossible for, often it's impossible for it to remove all of them because it's just not possible to draw a network in 2D without edge crossings for some networks and for most networks. Um, and, um, but if you want to strategically move things around, you might be able to do that. You might also be able to kind of move whole sections of the, of the network around so that you switch their positions. Um, sometimes that might be useful for layout purposes, and sometimes it may be useful for um, biological purposes. So maybe you want to group certain types of proteins together. The network layout algorithm doesn't necessarily know where they should go, but you want to put all the nuclear, nucleolus proteins here, and, or nuclear proteins here, and cytoplasmic proteins here. So you can, you can move around these modules and clumps if you want. Um, when we get into the enrichment map later, um, we do a lot of that moving, that editing, and um, most of it's done in Cytoscape, and then um, we, we do what I mentioned um, in terms of making a publication quality figure. Any, any other questions? Um, so the, the question is, um, how, you know, when would you actually use these, these strengths? Um, often we don't have that information of strengths with, with interactions. Some systems that we use, like ReactMFI, the, the confidence or the strength of the interaction is there, and then we can choose to use it. Um, it may not be useful to, to use it that much uh, for visualization purposes, but it's, it's very useful often to use it for filtering. So you might want to, especially if you get too much information, you can remove the, weak, the weaker uh, interactions and then focus on the stronger ones. Um, that's often a very valuable technique for dealing with too much information, as I mentioned here. So if you have too, much, too many connections, you can, you can either filter by if you have this information, um, and often you get really amazing results. Like you'll see structure in a hairball that looks like this. There is actually structure in here. You can sort of see these, um, these modules in here. If I were to remove, if I were to do some filtering on this, I might really see those coming out and see how they're connected to each other, whereas they're hidden right now. Um, the, um, I don't know if that answers your question. So I wouldn't worry too much about the edge weights because often we don't have them. Um, protein interactions, often we don't have that information. Um, you'll see in Gene Mania that um, some of the networks have weights and some of them don't. Sometimes there's a natural weight, a natural weight that's a, that comes with a network. Like if you're using co-expression networks, the natural weight is the correlation coefficient. Um, and so it really depends on your networks. Protein interactions, you almost, you, you rarely have it. Uh, Correlation-based networks, you, you do have it. Functional interaction networks, you often have it. And so it, it depends a little bit on, on the type of network that you're, that you're using. Is that? Yeah, so I wouldn't say that it's, it's, it's important to think about all the time. It's, it's, um, it's not a core concept that we need to worry about too much. Um, 
but if, it, if you happen to have that information, then it could be useful for filtering, and then you may want to visualize it. But that, that doesn't come up too often in papers that are typically published with network, network analysis. Um, so, um, so I mentioned filtering. Uh, the other obvious way to deal with too much information is to zoom in, and often you want to zoom in on some, some area of interest, like a set of genes that's involved in this phenotype or a set of genes involved in a pathway. Okay, so um, we, you know, I think you guys have also tried visualizing. Um, you know, you've, you've played with networks. You've seen their, their uh, you've uh, seen how they're laid out. Um, today we'll get into a little bit more sort of different options for for doing things, um, especially in in relation to use of Cytoscape. Um, there are a lot of different ways to visualize network information, and there's a lot of attributes that you can use for nodes and edges, and um, that um, that uh, um, can be mapped to various different types of visual attributes. So in general, we think of nodes, the, the core idea of a network just has nodes and edges. There's nothing else. Um, that's it. You, what we've added in biology is a label. So clearly, you need a name for the node. And you usually don't have a name for the, for the, for the interaction. Um, and then often, there's lots of information that we attach to nodes. Because nodes represent genes, and genes have lots of information, like gene ontology categories and um, and other information, um, and uh, and so we can just attach lot like whole spreadsheets to each node, basically, and and, and interaction. Um, those can be mapped to visual attributes. So, for instance, if I have gene ontology categories, if I have a set of functional categories, like ten functional categories, I can map those to colors, and I can have different colors viewed in the network that are related to function. Um, and really, this is up to your imagination and how you draw the network. But it's just a useful concept to just think about how you have data in your network and you, have, and you can visualize it. And that's one of the core parts of Cytoscape is, is, um, is uh, um, that idea of mapping data to visual attributes in a network. And this network that, we've, um, that we published in that, that primer um, uses Cytoscape. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll just go through quickly. Um, so blue, uh, the color is, is related to the uh, function, um, some, some functional term, uh, kinetic core, nucleosome, replication fork, and um, uh, the, the edge width is related to the correlation of gene expression. Um, the edge is there or not if it was found in a protein interaction. And the... Um, size of the node is proportional to how high the, ex the maximum expressed transcript was in this experiment, which is cell cycle tracking in, in yeast. Um, and then um, we used a four-structured automatic layout. We manually moved some of these things around, um, and, but mostly it was the result of the force-directed layout that, that made it look like this. And, um, and then we saved it as a PDF, and we added this purple circle here, um, this purple cloud, I guess, in Adobe Illustrator, we added this arrow. Um, we, um, and the, you know, all these little clouds we added. And we, we moved the labels around a little bit so that they were more visible, so that there was no, nothing overlapping the labels so that you can actually read the labels. Um, and we added these large uh, labels here um, to, um, uh, in the drawing program. And actually, some of these things now you can add in Cytoscape. It's called annotations on the network, and we can look at that. Um, and um, but they, they probably look better if you add them in a Adobe Illustrator. Um, and as we discussed in this primer, um, obviously it's useful for data relationships. There's this idea of guilt by association, where you can predict the function of genes if they're linked to a lot of genes of known function. And we'll talk a lot about that tomorrow with Quaid telling you about gene mania. Um, these dense clusters, you've seen how they're useful in the Reactome FI plugin and global relationships between these clusters might might tell you something interesting. Okay, any questions about network visualization? Yep. Sorry, what was the question? Yeah. 
you can just have the name, and the names can be linked to colors. Um, I'll show you how that works in Cytoscape, at least. Okay? Okay, so um, any other questions about network visualization? So um, the, this sort of summarizes what we've talked about, but because it's pretty basic, I think we'll, we'll go over it um, quickly. Um, and we can move to network visualization analysis using Cytoscape. So, um, so we'll talk about Cytoscape as software, um, some of the basics and, and some examples. Uh, everyone has used Cytoscape, so the, the goal of this, this uh, section is to fill in, again, fill in gaps um, uh, and, and answer questions about Cytoscape. Can Cytoscape do this or that? That's usually the most useful thing. So Cytoscape is um, free software for network visualization and analysis, originally developed at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle um, by Trey Eidecker when he was, and Ben Oshwikowski. So Trey was a PhD student with Lee Hood, who coined the term systems biology, I think. Um, plus he did a lot of other interesting things, um, like invent automated DNA sequencing. And um, so the um, Ben Oshwik was a, as a faculty there, and they both worked on the first version of Cytoscape. Um, then they moved in different places. Trey is now in San Diego and Ben is in, in Paris. Um, and multiple people have joined the consortium over, over time. So after Cytoscape was made, it was made freely available in open source. So open source means that the source code is made public and anybody can contribute. And, that, and it turns out lots of people um, contributed to this project. I, I got involved pretty early because I was working on something similar in my graduate work. Um, developing a network visualization system. And, um, but then when I saw Cytoscape, it looked like they were ahead. So I said, okay, I'm not going to work on mine anymore. Let's just collaborate and work on, on this together. And so through that, um, so that's one nice thing about open source development is that you can um, focus more on science. You don't have to redevelop, reinvent the wheel. You can collaborate um, developing tools that everybody needs. And then you can develop the the more important stuff that's more related to your to your research. Um, so I'll talk about about that. Oops, looks like this was cut off here. Um, so um, as you guys have seen, Cytoscape provides lots and lots of different functionality, um, and uh, it's very very useful for visualization. It's not the only network visualization software. There's probably quite a few others that are out there. This is the mo vastly the most popular one, and um, and it's the only one that's really available for for free. And open open source, um, yeah. So so Ingenuity is more about pathway analysis. So I can I can mention that in general. Um, I think that that's related to this this entire course. So um, I don't see I don't. Um, think that Ingenuity is, uh, I don't think of Ingenuity as a network visualization um, system. It does have some network visualization parts in it, but mostly it's, um, it's a, the good thing about Ingenuity is that it's a commercial product that has a really nice um, system that they've made. You have to pay for it, but it's, it works well, it's smooth, they have documentation and support. Um, it's, um, so that's a good thing about it. Another good thing about it is that they've spent a huge amount of money, like $50 million, um, collecting the biggest network database that they can collect. Um, and they don't give that out to anybody. It's only accessible via Ingenuity Pathway Analysis. Um, and um, you basically can't, can't buy it. So um, compared to public, public data, like the React MFI, the Ingenuity Pathway Analysis database is bigger than anybody else's. Um, the, so that's, that's interesting. Um, whether how useful that is in terms of actually getting better results is um, probably case, case dependent. Um, but uh, the disadvantage is that it has a very limited set of features compared to what's publicly available. So they've taken like three types of analyses and um, all of the analyses that we talk about in this course are, are at more advanced than those statistically and and they, they're, there's better concepts in general because they're they're really kind of stuck in analysis that was popular originally seven eight years ago. Um, so, for instance, they they have a, a enrichment analysis, but they don't do like what GSEA does with the with the ranking. Um, so they're they're just limited to having a cutoff of like focus genes that you that you analyze. Um, so that 
is missing out on what we discussed as advantageous for GSEA. Um, they also have a, um, a way of finding networks that are related to enriched in your gene list. That's pretty good, I think. And um, it's an interesting uh, analysis. Um, analysis. They, they, they have a lot of additional data, like drug uh, interactions and things that they make very easy to, to see. Um, the, um, but not, um, the, uh, there's, a, there's a wider variety of things. I'd say, you know, we never, we, we've done, we have one paper where we really compared Ingenuity and, um, and Cytoscape on the same data set, and I could tell you that reference. Um, it, um, it was published last year, I think, um, and uh, and what we could see is that a lot of the same themes came up in either one, um, but there was actually some unique to one, some unique to the other. So, in that case, there was a little bit more information that you got by doing two. But if you had done one or the other, you you know, in terms of the types of themes that you saw enriched, often you know a lot of the major ones were all there, um, and um, you know, so I'm not sure how. That if you have a license to it, it's definitely useful. If if you're, yeah, yeah, I think I think that that it is useful because mainly the database that they have, that's the biggest, and the, it's nice and user friendly. But you know, that's not that you can get get away with, not having something user friendly as long as it's good, right? Um, but really, the, the key thing scientifically is that their database is very different than the public databases. I'm sure they pull in all the public databases as well. Yeah. So it's like the it's like the controversy over the public genome project and the private genome project. <laughs> the private genome project took all the public data to help their assembly. Um, so. Um, um, but that's that's fine, and that's why we're making data available for free, so everybody can use it. Um, okay, so uh, Cytoscape um, is really focused on networks, uh, and it doesn't. It's not really focused on gene lists. So w this course really talks about gene lists and starting with a gene list and then doing analysis on the gene list. With Cytoscape, there's a step that you need to do to convert your gene list to a network. And uh, the Reactome FI plugin uh, app is very useful because it does that for you, right? You give it a gene list, it gets a network for you, and then does some analysis. Um, we'll talk about Gene Mania tomorrow is another app that can do that for you. But by default, Cytoscape doesn't do that. When you just download Cytoscape and start running it, it's, it starts with a network. Um, that's particularly useful if you have a network already, and many people do. So if you're studying protein interactions, for instance, you're mapping them with proteomics, the first thing that you want to do with your data is visualize the network. And that Cytoscape can't be beat, basically, for that. Um, right off the bat, it's, it's useful for that. Um, but that's one confusing aspect if, versus you know, how it fits in this course, just the, the, this relationship between gene list and, and network. Um, so just keep that in mind, that when we go through Cytoscape, we're talking about networks. But somehow, you have to get the network from somewhere, right? So Lincoln talked about networks and pathway databases, and we've looked at Re Reactome FI. So, um, there are ways to do that, but um, what I'm talking about here is sort of the typical Cytoscape case where you start with a net, you load a network in, and that's where you start. Um, so network information comes from databases and is loaded in, and then you do some analysis on that network. Um, so um, Cytoscape has lots of different features. Uh, these slides are out of date, but I'll go over the, the latest version um, and. Um, it by default, it doesn't really help you do much analysis. It's just a visualization and filtering and querying system, and the automatic layout is there. Um, and the um, and there's databases that you can search, which is useful. Um, probably the most valuable aspect of Cytoscape is that because it's a free, freely available system, and also um, it has a, it allows people to write extensions that um, we call apps now. We used to call them plugins. Um, so we have an app store that was more um, fashionable, I guess. <laughs> so um, if you go to apps.cytoscape.org, how many people have gone to apps.cytoscape.org already? Okay, only a couple. So um, we, can, we can look at that, but apps.cytoscape.org has over 200 apps that you can download, and they do different types of analyses, like the Reactome FI app. Um, Cytoscape gets, um, has 
thousands of users, and um, I think these, these statistics are even out of date now. I think it's like 8,000 downloads per month, um, and, um, and thousands of people are using it, using it per day. Um, there's quite a lot of documentation, so it's good that the reason I'm mentioning that is not to say that, oh, you know, it's great that everybody's using it. The reason why I'm mentioning that is that it's an active community of users that help new users as well. So um, if you, um, you know, people, there's this very busy mailing list that um, if you ask a question, there's a bunch of people on that mailing list that will help you answer your question. And usually um, we try to guarantee an answer to the question within a week. Um, so it shouldn't be longer than one week that you that you wait. Um, there are uh, quite a bit of documentation and data sets that people are making available. Um, tutorials are available that you guys went through. Uh, there's an annual conference. Um, the next one will be hopefully in Boston uh, sometime this year. Um, and, and on all these apps that are being developed by this community as well. So um, if you want to, if there's something missing in Cytoscape, you can, you can build it if you know how to program, um, or if you have a friend who knows how to program, um, it's possible to do that, and many people have, have done this. And usually each one of these has a publication um, that they've, they've published. So this is just a picture from a, a Cytoscape meeting that we had in Toronto uh, a few years ago where everyone's spelling Cytoscape just for fun. Um, so it's a, it's a fun community. Um, OK, so Cytoscape is useful, free software for network visualization analysis. It's not the only one. By default, it provides basic network manipulation features, um, but you really need apps and data to make that useful for, for any particular task. And that's one of the, one of the difficulties um, with Cytoscape is because it's, it's a workbench, um, imagine you, you're building something with tools and you come to a workbench, you have all the tools, but how do you know which order you have to use the tools in, right, to actually make a table or something like that? Um, so whenever you have a workbench situation, you're always faced with that problem. You have lots of tools. How do you string them together into useful things? Um, and so in this course, that's why we're talking about workflows and we're telling you about some of these useful, useful workflows. But um, there are many inside Escape, and once you get to know it, know it there's, a, um, there's a, uh, lots of things that you can do with it. It's very powerful, but that comes at a cost of having to learn that. Okay, so um, I'm going uh, to de just demo, um, go over Cytoscape um, features here. Um, I have it up here. So it's actually Cytoscape 3.1.0 um, that we recommended for this class, although just a few days ago or maybe a week ago we released 3.1.1, which has uh, fixed a lot of bugs. Um, okay, so. Um, I think everyone saw this, so the welcome screen is the first thing that comes up. And this was added to really try to help people um, uh, get started um, with some network data. So if you're working on a different organism, you can click, um, you know, get download this network. If I click on any of these buttons, the networks that are, that are going to be downloaded are actually quite big because it's um, all the protein interactions for a whole organism. Um, it could be hundreds of thousands of, of or more than 100,000 connections. Um, it should be downloaded pretty quickly, um, but then you'll get this network that will be difficult to work with to visualize. Um, so the, the useful thing with this is certain workflows that need a network to start, and then you add your, you query your network with your gene list to identify interesting parts. Um, you, can, you can start with the network from, from here. Um, I'm going to, I loaded up um, the, um, uh, sample session file that is uh, comes with Cytoscape, and um, I'll just load that up to, to show you how it works. So I think as everybody everybody saw, you can um, you can zoom in and out and move move nodes around. Um, you can select a bunch of nodes and move them around. Um, there are lots of different layout algorithms. Um, the default layout when you start, if I if I just click this button here, apply preferred layout. Um, it will lay things out using the force-directed layout. Um, and that is the Cytoscape force-directed layout. I can um, set my, um, there's a way of setting um, to, uh, setting the preferred layout if I, um, if I want uh, any layout here to be the, the layout that 
gets run when I click this button. You can you can do that. So in layout settings, um, but you can you can um, see there's all sorts of um, interesting layouts. So I just urge you to um, to try these out yourself and see how they they all look. Um, okay, so. Um, Maybe I should mention a couple of things about specific layouts. So Y files is used to be our favorite layout. Y files organic is a force directed layout and used to be the one that I recommend everybody to start with because it's really it's really good and fast. Um, the one problem with Y files is that it's a commercial product, and so some people um, had some um, um, issues with that because you couldn't use it in your own app. But um, and so we made a uh, a site escape um, force directed layout. That is um, one of these layouts. Actually, it used to be called Site Escape Layout, but I think we we renamed it um, to one of these force directed layouts. Um, so um, there's a, there's a bunch of other layouts that can lay things out based on attributes. So here is a um, there's a bunch of attributes that have already been loaded up. I'll talk about how those work. But I'll just try a, um, okay, no, that, that wasn't the one I wanted, um, a um, group attributes layout um, where I, I group things by some attributes. So in this case, it's the number of connections. So it doesn't really make sense. But you could have, notice that there's circles here. So there's multiple circles. Each of these is a different attribute. If I had functions, I could lay out my uh, attached to, if I had gene functions attached to the network, I could lay out the network based on functions, and each function would be grouped into its own circle. Um, OK, so you get the idea. Um, you can um, do some, some manual positioning of nodes that is helped by um, these, these functions here. Uh, you can rotate sets of nodes, so that's kind of fun. Um, you can scale nodes. Um, this is very useful if there's a lot of things bunched up together and you just want to spread them out. So you can, you can just spread them out like that. Um, and then there's also aligning distributing, so you can align them all to one corner, one side, or the other, um, you know, uh, and that, that might be helpful for manual, manual layout. Um, okay. Um, I also uh, talked about, um, so that's layout. I talked about if you have a hairball and you want to filter. Um, so one thing that you can do if you have too many nodes and edges is you can use this little search box at the top to just type um, search terms. And it gives you an example search query. So you can use a star for anything. So if I want all the genes that start with Y, it's everything because these are yeast genes. Let's try R. Um, so here is um, uh, here are a um, basically you know it found all the genes that start with R and it, it highlights them here um, and um, if I if I have some highlighted and I want to zoom in on them then I can just click to zoom selected region and it will give me um, give me those uh, right away um, okay more um, so usually if you want to cut a bunch of nodes out from a larger network, you might um, find that you've selected some nodes, and then you can, um, you, can t you can create a new network based on those selected nodes. And this allows you to zoom in on that network. And you can relay it out. And you can now it's, it's sort of more uh, manageable as a smaller network that you can play with. And the old network is up here, um, so you can go back and forth. Um, yeah? The, the, the normal layout, as I mentioned, doesn't consider the thickness or anything. It's just positioning the nodes. But there are, if you do have some um, value on the edge, um, and I'll just look on, on, on here, there is sort of a value here um, that was calculated. And I'll talk about these, what, you know, all these attributes in a, in a sec. Um, then you can use uh, the edge weighted layout and um, on that attribute. So in this case, it's called edge betweenness. Um, so if I do that, then um, um, I don't know what happened here. It didn't look like it worked very well. 
um, the network was like made really small. So that didn't really work. I think that the problem is is that um, these numbers are, are too big um, and I need to change some settings here which I didn't set up for. But um, But I, but I normally these these settings are set to have to expect edges uh, edge weights that are between zero and one, and I think these numbers are zero to twenty thousand or something like that. So it's not um, working very well. Um, but um, yeah, so I don't think I'm going to be able to fix this quickly. I'll see if I can fix it later, but. Um, uh, in general, it, it, it is possible to to use that kind of some edge weight to to, to lay the thing out. Um, we we only use that occasionally. Sometimes it, it's quite useful. Um, if you have a particular, I, I if you're working with co-expression networks like correlation, it's actually very useful. But most other networks, it's um, any kind of correlation network, it's very useful. Most other networks, it's it's not that important. Yes. Yeah. 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 And you can sometimes those network weights will come with the network from wherever you're getting it from. Okay. So um, uh, I think you guys noticed that um, when you click on a node um, or select when you select a node or an edges, then there are um, attributes at the bottom here that show you the type of data that's loaded up. Um, I will um, try to load up some more data to show you how that works, um, but there are attributes for nodes, edges, and the network. We rarely use attributes for the network, but nodes nodes we use all the time. In this case, we have names. We have um, a bunch of values that were computed uh, based on the structure of this network um, that uh, relate to how highly connected nodes are. And there's also gene expression data that was loaded up uh, from a, an experiment that had three different um, uh, experiments that had um, three different knockout conditions in yeast, and the expression ratio and the p-value associated with that are all loaded up. So there's three experiments, six columns are related to that, um, and um, and that's it. That's that's loaded up here. Um, I could also load up additional data. So one thing that I can load up is um, is uh, um, gene ontology information. So if I go to File Import and I select yeast and let me try the slim ontology, the, the yeast slim ontology and I will import that and I, I don't know how quickly that will take on this network connection. Um, okay, and there's a problem here. I think it loaded it all up. So, um, so now I have, um, now I have uh, one, one node here. Um, I have a lot more information here. Um, molecular function, um, the evidence code, uh, a reference, biological process, um, and um, what didn't get loaded up here is names for these, um, which so I think there was some issue with loading up this, this network. So maybe I'll try another network to see how that, that loads up. Um, Oh no, maybe it. Oh, it, it looked. Yeah, okay. Put it in somewhere else. So sorry, it's actually here. Um, there is uh, a column here that um, shows you that all the different Go term names, vacuole or organization, um, translational initiation. So now that I've loaded up, loaded that up, I can start searching for you know translation here, and um, it will find all of the. Um, Um, it find, it highlights all the nodes that are uh, have translation attached to them in some way. Um, okay, what else was I going to show next? Just turn that off. Um, I think you guys noticed these ability to zoom around and move this around to, to move the network around. Um, okay, so the the next thing I uh, a couple of other things I wanted to show you with Cytoscape are um, 
uh, one, okay, let's, let's do this one next, so we'll just zoom in here. Um, you can right click on nodes and edges and, and, and a, lot of, um, a lot of information is, is uh, a lot of functionality is built into these right click menus. So you can edit the network, you can add edges, you can select the first neighbors, um, you can group the nodes, and if you group them, they will, um, let's give it a group one. Um, now these nodes are grouped. If, if there's some interesting function and I wanted to reduce those, I can go to this group menu and I can say collapse groups, and then they, they collapse into a small, a small group. So this, this is now a group, it's not a protein. So it has, it has proteins inside. I can, I can, um, uh, I can ungroup the, 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 oh, sorry, I can expand the group and then it goes back to its, its original nodes. Um, and uh, so that's sometimes useful for grouping, grouping things. We don't have a really good way of visualizing those groups yet, so that's something that will be coming later. There's a little bit of uh, possible grouping that could occur um, if you have another network that you want to visualize as um, on this. And so if I add it, what I did was I added nested network. And so now when you zoom in here, there's actually a little network in here. So that's an interesting function if you want to build up networks hierarchically. Um, and um, but, but most of the time, you probably won't be doing that. Um, okay, so um, let's uh, get to what I wanted to show you. So that's nodes. You can do the same thing if you click on edges. You'll get a different set of menu items. Um, uh, there's a, when you start Cytoscape, there's nothing. If you don't have any apps installed, there's nothing in this apps menu. But if you add apps, some of those apps could add functionality into these menus. And then if you right-click on the... Um, the um, just the background. There's some interesting functionality for that we call annotations. So you can add an, a shape annotation, an image annotation, or text or bounded text. So bounded text. Um, I, I want it to be a, a rectangle using this font, and um, so this is what it will kind of look like. And maybe let's make the font bigger. Um, and we'll bold it, um, and now I can I can put it here, and now I can. Um, sorry. Um, there's some interfering with me using it, but um, yeah, so the Oh yeah, here's the, the text that I want to add. So I can type in like um, cell cycle um, and then um, change, my, change my settings and, um, and then I can put it where I want it to, to be. Um, and it's not the best user interface, but that's why I kind of prefer Adobe Illustrator right now. I think in the future um, this um, annotation system will, um, will, you know, so I can, I can delete it, but it's not easy to move it around. And it doesn't look as good as it would if it was in Adobe Illustrator. Um, and so while you can, you can do that, for sure, it's there, and you can save it. And you know, that, that's definitely useful. Um, it's not the, always the best looking. So I can delete it. And let's delete this one as well. Um, um, but there's other things that I can add, like um, I can add a, a shape annotation, um, like a custom shape or a rounded rectangle and I'll just add that around here so if I'm if I'm making a uh, network I can put nodes into a into a rectangle that rectangle will just sit there okay so um, sometimes that's that's useful um, okay um, Okay. The selection menu allows you to select all the nodes and edges, um, select nodes that are first neighbors of selected nodes. Um, you can, if you have a gene list, um, you can select all the nodes that are in that gene list if you have them in a file. So from ID list file, basically what, what that will allow you to do is put all of the identifiers of your genes in a file, and then um, you, if you have a network loaded, like all the, the whole human network, you can say select select all the genes that are in this, listed in this file. We'll select them and then you can do things with them. You can move them to a new network or you can, um, you can 
just lay those out. Lo lay those out. Um, okay. Um, okay. So getting into more interesting things, you met. There was a question about why these these edges are are um, thick here. Um, the uh, style, this little window here for style, is um, allows you to set up visual styles. How many people played with this already? Visual styles. A couple of people. So. Um, Visual styles are one of the most powerful features of, of Cytoscape. Um, they um, allow you to make all the visual magic that we've seen in network visualization happen. So there's just a few concepts here. Um, one is uh, there's a whole list of visual properties, like I mentioned, like the color of nodes. Um, so right now, nodes are colored by some value. I, I happen to know that they're colored by gene expression. Um, let me. Um, change it to something default. So this is, this is probably how the network would look if I just loaded it up by default. Um, and then um, I have all these attributes here, and I want to color things by attributes. Um, so one way I can do it is I can just select a bunch of nodes and say, OK, I want these nodes to be red. That's often the first thing that people try. It's not the recommended way of doing things by inside Escape, and I'll, I'll tell you why um, in a sec. But if it's sometimes useful, and um, you can do that by saying, "Okay, I'm selecting these nodes, and I go to fill color, and I and I click this little box here, and I want them all to be red." Okay, so now I unclick them, and they're all red. Um, so what I did there was I set up what's called a bypass. So there are three columns here. There's the default, which is um, in this case, this I'll just change the default to another color. So you see that all the, all the nodes. Um, change color when I change the default if they're not if there's no setting on them. The red nodes that I set are um, are I set them to be red, so I bypassed any setting that that's automatic, um, including default. And the um, um, and and so now they're they're kind of they'll stay red. Um, the problem with bypass is that they're not it's not dependent on the data. And the powerful aspect of vis network visualization is visualizing data. So um, let's get rid of the bypass. Um, I just click here and remove bypass, and now they're all default. Um, so now I can um, use this middle column, which is a map. So if I click on this, I will get two options, a column, um, which I'm going to choose gene expression values. Um, so I'm going to choose gal one rgexp which is I know is gene expression values. Um, they're ratios. Uh, uh, log two ratios, so they range from negative some number to positive some number, with zero meaning no change in expression in experiment versus control, and positive meaning the experiment's higher than control, negative meaning experiment's lower than control. Um, um, and I'm gonna, I'm going to choose a mapping type. So there are three different mapping types: continuous, discrete, and pass through. Um, what I want here is continuous mapping. Um, a continuous mapping maps a continuous number, like a, ra you know, a, a range of numbers, uh, to a continuous, um, a continuous visual attribute, like color. Um, and um, a discrete mapping would be you know, taking gene ontology terms and labeling them by color. Um, there's a term, it gets a color. Um, so um, if I click on this, if I double click on this, I get an editor for this, and I can say, OK, I'm, I want this um, uh, things that are underexpressed to be red, and things that are overexpressed uh, to be blue, and everything in the middle is going to be, um, let's add another point here. Everything in the middle is going to be white, so I'm going to set that to 0. And if I, I can double click, um, I can click on this, on this, this um, um, number and I can choose a number here. So I can just say 0. Um, um, and so now that 0 is, is white. So let's do OK. And um, as you can see, as I'm changing this, the, um, you know, the, the network is changing automatically. Um, so that's kind of useful. OK. So, um, so this, this node is like below my threshold, so it gets colored black, and I think there's some nodes that might get colored white. So, um, uh, so that's how to, so the, there's a wide range of, of visual properties here. 
Um, if you click this little properties button, you can see only certain ones are checked, so those are the ones that are active. There's a whole bunch of other ones that are, um, you know, possible to use, like, um, but, but all the, the uh, most commonly used ones are checked by default, so you can, but there are additional ones. So you can play with the um, border, the width of the border, um, the label, the label color, the label font, the label size, and the shape of the node. Um, so maybe I, I don't like these things, I want all my nodes to be uh, rec I, I want all my nodes to be octagons. Um, so now they're now they're all octagons. So um, the um, size I can change the size, etc. So this is useful sometimes. The if you want the labels to all be in the the box. Um, so you might say that you want the shape to be a rectangle um, and the size to be um, uh, slightly bigger. Let's try 50 and. That's not big enough, so let's try 60. So now the labels are, are in the box. Um, there's no, unfortunately, automatic way of sizing things according to the labels like there should be. But um, there is, and, and by default, if you wanted to just get a rectangle, you could unclick this lock node width and height. And now you have um, the height and the width are separate, not just the size of the node. Um, but the height can be, can be smaller, and it, it'll be smaller here. Um, OK, let's see what else. Transparency is kind of nice sometimes um, for edges where you have weights, um, which I keep on mentioning. But um, okay, so one interesting thing. Let me try um, just one additional thing that's kind of hidden that is sometimes useful. If I um, change this to a discrete mapping, um, so now and let me choose a. Um, Okay, let me choose a biological process evidence code. So now I have gene ontology evidence codes here, and if I want to color them, color nodes by evidence codes, then um, I can set up colors here. So usually you just pick a color, um, but if you want just a whole bunch of colors, you can right click and click um, a mapping value generator and just say rainbow, and it will just it will give you a whole bunch of colors automatically. Um, and now my network is rainbow colored um, for, for what, whatever use that is um, in this case. So usually um, it would be useful if you have some categorical data that you want to color um, each thing as a separate color. Um, okay, so I'm, I, sh all, I showed all these visual properties. You have the same things for net for edges. Um, edge um, width you can set to the um, you know to be a continuous a continuous value based on edge betweenness and let's. Let's just try it, and now I have. Um, you can see the thickness of the width of the edges is is uh, modified according to this edge betweenness, um, which I can talk about exactly what that means. Yeah. Um, so the curvy lines are called um, edge bends, and. They were um, some of these layout um, layout. Um, okay, so there's a couple of options in the layout um, menu that kind of do do the curvy lines. So one of them is bundle edges, and this might be a little bit buggy. So I, um, in this version, because I know there was a bug here. So let me um, bundle all the edges, um, and um, so now the you know what it tries to do is kind of put the edges together a little bit if they're similar. So it doesn't really do much in this network, but here's an example where these two edges were kind of close to each other, and then they, they got bundled. So they'll, they'll overlap in this, in this part, but because they're both going into the same node, it's not losing information, but it's saving you um, space, basically. So um, now, these, now these edges are, are, um, have uh, bends to them. So I can clear the, the edge bends. And, and they disappear. I can also, um, if I have more than one edge between a node, let's see if I can just quickly set that up here. Um, so I can add an edge to the node. Um, OK, so let me select two nodes. And I can add an edge connecting selected nodes. Um, okay, I don't know what happened there. So I don't know if the edge actually got created. Let's see if I can try that again. So now I've created an edge. The second edge 
Usually you don't have two edges between nodes, sometimes you can. Um, you can have multiple different interaction types represented as different edges. And in this case, the, sec all, the, the first edge is always straight, and the second one is, a, is bent um, by default. You can also right-click on these things, and um, there is some... Um, I think um, there is a, a way of, if you press on the Mac, it's Alt, and you click on an edge, then it adds a little, a little control point. You can add as many of them as you want. And so you can actually like, drag the edges around, and so that might help you a little bit. Um, so it's the Alt Option key on the Mac, and I think it's Control on Windows. Um, it's Alt on Windows as well. Okay. Um, so those things can be... Um, um, removed as well. Um, I, with, oops. Um, clear all edge bends. That clear all edge bends clears everything, but there's actually a, a key to remove them, and I just I never use that feature, so I forget what it is now. Um, does anybody know? TAs. So, um, I think it's just clicking Alt again on the same node gets rid of it. Okay, um, clicking Option. Sorry? Uh, yeah, the, the clearing, clearing all edge bends will get rid of everything. Get rid of all those bends. Yeah. What kind of sets are you? So yes, I think the answer is yes. But what kind of sets are you talking about? Yeah. If you have an attribute called groups and you say all these nodes are part of group one and all these nodes are part of group two, group one can get diamonds and group two can get triangles. So that's very easy to set up. So that you would set up, you'd have an attribute with that information and then you would set up a node shape mapper that maps a discrete, it's a discrete mapper, so it, it's dealing with discrete or categorical ver data. Um, and you just say, if it's group one, it's a diamond. If it's group two, it's a, 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 a triangle. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so I should get going. There's a couple, just a couple, I think there's just one more thing that I, two more things that I wanted to mention. Uh, filters um, allows you to, um, uh, filters allows you to um, do more, more complicated queries on the, on the network. Um, you can, um, Any of your uh, in your uh, attributes here, you can you can um, select. So this is node degree. Node degree is the, the number of connections per node. Um, and in this case, I'm just I'm just selecting say the highest degree nodes. So let me select the nodes that are have more than five or five or more connections. Um, and then I can also uh, select nodes that have five or more connections and that are also um, overexpressed. Um, let's see. In this experiment, so they're they're um, they're overexpressed, and if I want to do or or and, I can choose that here. Um, there's also, in general, these filters are, are automatically applied. Um, you can create new filters and rename them, and import them and export them. Um, there's this little button at the bottom here called chain, which is not very useful at this point, but um, it allows you to chain filters together, so you could make more complicated filters. Um, the um, uh, couple of other things I didn't mention, the app manager. Um, the app manager allows you to install apps. So you can go and, and see, you know, um, look at apps, look at all the apps here, um, and, uh, and install them. Probably what's more useful is if you go to the app store and um, 
if you're browsing around the App Store, like one of the things that we um, just released is Word Cloud, and I want to install Word Cloud, um, I can just click this button here, and it will it will install it for me into Cytoscape. So um, now it's it's here in my Cytoscape window. So by going on the web, you just click and in install. So that would be a much easier way of just installing apps. So um, the um, the other thing I, I didn't really talk about was importing data. So just, just one thing to mention, one last thing to mention is um, I loaded up a session that has a lot of information um, loaded up. Um, but if you don't have a session already created, you uh, need to load it in somehow. So you either load it in from a database like Reactome FI, you download an app, you give it a gene list, it gives you some inf networks. That's probably mostly the way that you probably do it. If you had network information you want to load up, you usually have a file. Um, and um, there's a whole bunch of sample files here, like um, um, galfilter.xls, which is a, a spreadsheet, um, a, an Excel spreadsheet. And then I get this, this um, dialog box that opens up that says, um, OK, what do you want to do here? Um, I'm selecting column 1 as the source, and column 2 as the target. So now these two columns are highlighted. These are my interactions. Um, all these additional columns I might want to in, in, like, um, load up, um, I can load them up uh, as um, you know, additional attributes that will be no, uh, edge attributes in this case. Because these are in, each row here is an interaction, and these, these two things define the nodes that are part of that interaction, or participating in the interaction, and the rest are um, attributes of the edge. So if I load that up, I will get a network that, and this, is, this will be the default in Cytoscape, you, you um, uh, get a network that's not laid out, um, so the first thing you do is, is lay it out, and that's obviously much more, much more useful. Notice that when um, I zoom out after a certain point, the labels disappear. This is an optimization to basically not take up too much computer resources while you're looking at really big networks. Um, but if you want to have, um, and, and so their little details of the visualization are turned off as you zoom out. Um, if you want to have them always on, you can go to uh, view and say show graphics details. And now whenever I zoom out, there, the labels are always be there. It doesn't really matter too much with this network because it's kind of small. But if I had a really big network, that might be an issue. Um, OK. Um, any other questions? There's lots of other features. Um, you know, everything that you see here, usually there's a right-click menu, and you can do um, various different things, like I can delete these networks, um, I can name them. Um, there's lots of, lots of options. Um, any questions, general questions about Cytoscape? OK, yeah? No, this network is an a old protein interaction network that was published in science in 2001 um, that was related to this yeast glucose metabolism. How it was generated by yeast 2 hybrid protein interactions, and maybe it also contained additional protein interactions from other sources. So it was experimentally defined. Well, Reactome doesn't give you the full change. Um, so usually, usually the, when you get a network loaded in, you'll just get the connections. And you may get some attributes on the nodes, um, and maybe a, a edge weight, like an edge, like interaction strength or confidence. Um, but, um, and so you have to load in all of your attributes yourself. So normally what you do is you have your network, and then if you want to load in attributes, you'd set those up in an Excel file. Maybe you download that from Biomart like we saw yesterday, and, uh, and you progressively load up data. You apply the data to the network, and it'll, it's all saved in Cytoscape. And then when you save your, your sessions, I didn't mention like just saving, saves a session. It saves everything that you've done. Um, if I have nodes selected, I have filters defined, everything gets saved in your session, you can take that to another computer and load it back up. And everything that you've 
done will be the same. Um, so that session just saves all of that information that you're loading up. Once it's loaded in, then you can, you can work with it. You can do visual mappings. Um, you can filter based on it. You can analyze data based on it. There, there, um, the betweenness and other things, actually, there's a couple of tools that are kind of here um, um, by default. So one of them is called Network Analyzer. So you can click Analyze Network. And what it will do is um, you can say treat the network as directed or undirected. So undirected means um, there's no direction of the connections, of the interactions. And then um, I click OK, and it gives me a bunch of statistics about the network, like clustering coefficient, connected components, node degree distribution, um, average clustering coefficient, all these graphs, uh, shortest path length distribution, shared neighbor distribution, betweenness centrality. So um, I don't find these super useful for biological insight, but there's a lot of, um, there's a couple of reasons why you'd want to do this. So um, there's an idea that if you have a really big network and uh, certain nodes are central in that network, that they're more important. And people have shown that by search looking at how protein interaction networks correlate with essentiality and the Gene, the, the proteins that are most highly connected in the network are correlated quite strongly with essentiality. So the more highly connected they are, the more likely they are to be essential genes in the system. Um, and so one way, thing that you can do when you have a network is look for important nodes. Um, you can have these, uh, this, this, this tool calculates a whole range of different values of importance. Um, centrality, they're, sometimes they're called centrality measures. The simplest one is degree, how many connections the node has. The more connections, the more important it is. Um, another one is how many shortest paths go through the node, and that's called the betweenness centrality. So how important is this node? Like if you took this node out, the network would, like if you took all the nodes that had high, had a lot of paths going through them, the network would fall apart. Um, so they're, they're important for keeping the structure of the network. So sometimes those are useful um, statistics. Um, if anyone has any questions about any of that stuff, or, or um, just let me know. Any other questions? Yeah, so that is the confusing part of kind of teaching Cytoscape in this course and how we've kind of structured it. So the course is all about gene lists, and as I said, Cytoscape, when you use it, and every document that you look is all about networks. So um, normally, you would, if you didn't have this course and you learned Cytoscape and you want to learn it, the first thing that you need to think about is getting network data into the, into the, into the program. And so you would have some networks that you got from somewhere um, which may be difficult for you to get, but there are lots of resources available for downloading networks, but um, you'd have that, that network data that you'd collect from somewhere and then you'd load it in. The welcome screen of Cytoscape kind of tries to help by having single buttons that download some standard data sets, but they may not be the ones that you want. Um, um, so in the context of this course, where we're starting from a gene list, there are two apps that help you load up a gene list and get a network view that you can analyze in Cytoscape. One is Reactome FI, and the other one is Gene Mania, which we'll talk about tomorrow. So that's why we're talking about those. Yeah. 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 So you can load up Cytoscape and then immediately start Reactome FI, just like you guys did. Put in your gene list, and then you're good, and you have your whole analysis pipeline that's done. Okay, but if you end up getting to use the reason why we're talking about Cytoscape more generally is because there are all these other apps. And it's, it's this really powerful tool because of all these, this functionality. So just learning about it in general is useful for you later to go off and, um, well, it's useful now during this course to actually just use it for the few workflows that we're doing. But also later, exploring the App Store is a really interesting thing to do if you're interested in learning about different types of network analysis that are out there that we don't, we would never be able to cover and take weeks and weeks to cover everything. So would you recommend one of those two tools then to get the network first, rather than taking one of the species, getting that big network, and then filtering it over? 
the genes in it? Yeah, so I guess Reactome FI only supports which organisms? Human, only human, right? So, so um, that's the limitation of, of Reactome FI. Um, the uh, gene mania supports, um, I think the next release will have E. coli in it, but otherwise it's all eukaryotic systems and seven or eight organisms. Um, whereas Cytoscape is general, so if you have um, other organisms you, that you could get that network from from somewhere, you can um, you can you can, can use it. the whole thing and then make it subnetwork. Yeah, that. yeah. There's different types of analyses, but say you could um, run the same type of uh, Reactum FI system to identify modules. Um, there is um, uh, a plug an app in Cytoscape called Cluster Maker that can do the clustering for you, and there's an app called Bingo that, um, which I'll mention in a, in a sec, a number of these, um, that can uh, do the enrichment, the pathway enrichment analysis on any, any set of genes in Cytoscape. So you could recreate, if, even though Reactome FI is really kind of focused on human, if you're working on C. elegans, for instance, or anything else, you could recreate that workflow using other apps in Cytoscape. Load up the C. elegans network, select your genes, um, get the, the subnetwork that's just related to your genes and maybe it's, it's neighbors um, and, um, and then use cluster maker to identify the modules and then take those modules and use bingo to um, do the pathway enrichment analysis. So that would be one workflow that would similar to the React MFI workflow. Any other questions? Okay, so um, let me just skip forward because these are all just backup slides. Um, so um, this this is the the workflow that we um, used last year um, that I updated in the in the yesterday morning. Um, but it's it's kind of more uh, Cytoscape oriented. But again, it's getting you this um, this uh, it's answering the question about geneless versus network. So um, Gene Mania, Reactome FI are useful for getting networks. There's actually other ones, Agile Lich Search, String, IREF Web. Um, um, you have different types of networks that you might be working with. They're all, they all have one thing in common. You're visualizing them. Cytoscape is useful for all types of networks. Um, and then there's different types of analysis that you might do, like the pathway enrichment analysis, uh, regulatory network analysis, um, uh, gene function prediction, which we'll talk about tomorrow, and module detection, which is what you learned about with Reactome FI. And here are the names of the apps that are um, available for doing these different different things. So this cluster maker I mentioned for module detection and bingo for pathway enrichment analysis. Um, in the rest of this, um, this slide deck, uh, there are a bunch of um, uh, there are a bunch of apps that are mentioned. Um, some of them are old uh, apps um, that I probably should update, but they're still useful. So that's one good thing to mention is that not every app that's ever been published for Cytoscape is currently available for Cytoscape 3. Um, per, Cytoscape 3 is fairly new, so apps are still being ported over. But um, so if there's an app that you uh, or a plugin that you like, you can always load an older version of Cytoscape. If, and it only works on an old version of Cytoscape, you can always go back to that old version of Cytoscape and it works roughly the same as the current one um, and um, that's totally valid. Um, there's a, a really interesting app, uh, Agile Literature Search, which um, if you don't have a lot of information known from databases or that's present in databases about your um, genes, you can type them into Agile Literature Search and it will go to PubMed and try to extract relationships um, automatically from PubMed using text mining. Um, so um, this, uh, this is another way to convert a gene list into a network. Um, it might not work with really big gene lists, but you can type in a bunch of genes and it will go to PubMed. It will find all the abstracts related to those genes and then extract interactions um, based on text mining. So we'll look for sentences that says, say things like A interacts with B and then we'll draw a connection between A and B. Um, and then you can you can actually click on the um, edges that it creates and it tells you what sentence it came from and if you don't like the sentence you can delete it um, but it's a it might be a, it's a good way of kind of getting a network that you might not be able to get easily from other sources um, there's a, a, a an app called netmatch that um, finds little feedback loops and, and things like that um, 
there, uh, at the end of this um, is Cytoscape tips and tricks. Um, a couple of these things I didn't mention, but you can read through these. Uh, I don't really need to go over them. Um, I mentioned some of them. Um, but this is um, uh, this is you know just a couple of things that might be useful if you end up using Cytoscape a lot. Um, okay, so I think we're still going till three, right, Michelle? Yeah, at three. Okay. So um, any questions? Any more questions about Cytoscape? Okay. So what we're going to do for the rest rest of the day is um, talk about uh, enrichment maps, and um, we'll see how much I can get through before the break. Um, uh, and then in the afternoon session, we'll have a lab that is using enrichment maps make your, to make basically making your own enrichment maps that uh, that Veronique will, will lead. Okay, so we learned yesterday about uh, what I call a pathway enrichment test, and more generally, people call gene set enrichment test. Um, and you know, the, the general idea is that you have uh, your experiment and your pathways, and your, your, you want to find which pathways are enriched in, in the experiment. So that's great. It's used, I think I counted just, I took a few papers that have pop, uh, popular tools that have published a paper, like David and GSEA and a few others, and just counted the, the citations for them. And I think just a few papers, I counted 20,000 citations. So there's a huge number of papers using this method. Um, it's very useful. However, one of the problems that you may have noticed um, when you're doing this is that there's a lot of uh, redundancy in these, in these terms. So if I look at this list, um, taxis, chemotaxis, okay, those are related. I can see they both say taxis. But I have to really know a lot about biology to see that um, some of these things are, um, you know, there's a bunch of immunity things, but myeloid cell differentiation is probably immunity. Um, uh, lymphocyte, okay, so that, I guess, you know, there's some of these things are, are really related to immunity, but they might not say immunity, inflammatory response. Um, uh, leukocyte activation. Um, so there's actually a whole bunch of terms here related to immunity. They're all spread out all over this list. It would be really nice if I could put those all together automatically. So um, so one way of, uh, so, so this is a list, and um, it's not really the best way of visualizing this because there's relationships between these terms. So what, 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 would, we, what would we do if we saw this? If we had a list with that there's relationships, what would we want to do? Visualize as a network, exactly. So if we have relationships that we want to visualize, we want to look at, so it's hard to see the relationships in this, in this table. So we um, have developed a, a, a visualization technique called enrichment map. Um, there's actually a couple of other similar, similar ideas out there um, um, that uh, uh, shows that converts this, this data into kind of a network. And this is what I showed for the autism paper. Um, so the way this works, um, what we typically do, uh, we do a lot of gene expression analysis. Veronique does a, a huge amount. Um, uh, we take the experiment, uh, our ranked gene lists. We run GSEA, which you learned about yesterday. In this case, we don't just get enriched pathways. We get pathways that are enriched in the genes going up and pathways that are enriched in the genes going down. And so we'll color those red going up and blue going down. Um, and then we, we, the enrichment map is a network where each node represents a pathway, and the edge represents the um, basically crosstalk between the pathways. So you have two pathways, and they, they have some crosstalk. Crosstalk is measured based on shared genes. So spindle and cell cycle share a lot of genes, and they have a lot of genes in common, um, and the, you know, these two pathways have fewer genes in common. So the thickness of the, of the edge, of the interaction, is proportional to the number of genes, the, number, the amount of crosstalk of these pathways. Also, the size of the nodes, um, which is not shown here effectively, um, is proportional to the number of genes in the pathway. And the color of the nodes uh, is proportional to the enrichment score that we looked at yesterday. So um, that might be the normalized p-value um, or some other score that comes out of uh, GSEA or, or G-profiler. Um, um, okay, so there are three major sort of use cases of 
the enrichment map that we that we think about right now. Um, one is um, you have you want to visualize a, a single enrichment pathway enrichment analysis result. So here I'm taking um, we took some um, breast cancer uh, some gene expression data that was published for breast cancer cells uh, that were treated with estrogen, and um, there were three replicates treated versus untreated. Um, all the processing was done to identify differentially expressed genes. We used GSEA with a gene ontology database to find our enriched pathways. And then, um, and then we made an enrichment map with the Cytoscape enrichment map app. So the enrichment map takes the results of GSEA and draws this, this, this nice thing, except for two things. One, it doesn't currently draw, uh, it doesn't currently make the, the nice labels here and doesn't currently make the nice bubbles here. So everything else other than labels and the bubbles are done automatically in GS in enrichment map. Um, all the coloring and the construction of the network, et cetera. Um, and, um, and then we usually use PowerPoint or something like that to overlay, to just quickly annotate this. Um, in the future, we hope to automate that. Here's a zoom in. So you can see that, um, that each of these circles here is a different go term, biological process. So it's, it's basically a, a different pathway. So I should quickly mention that this is useful for getting a very quick overview of the functional themes that are coming out of your enrichment analysis. So there are a few functional themes, and these ones are going up, and these ones are going down. Um, so very quickly, instead of looking at this table and seeing how everything relates, in basically a, a few seconds, I can just look at this and get a very quick sense of what's going on. Um, and uh, obviously, you have to. Um, uh, do some more work to interpret it, um, but again, thinking back to our our our, wor our workflow where we identify interesting pathways and then drill down or zoom in, um, this is very useful for identifying interesting pathways because you could say, oh, I know all of this. Oops, Peter, I like it when it does that. Um, I um, I know all of these things, um, but oh, this is interesting. Maybe this is a new. Uh, a new um, pathway that you didn't really expect to find, um, and so that might be um, something to follow up on. So maybe you can go zoom in on those genes in there. Um, okay, enrichment map is also useful for comparison of two enrichments. Uh, so say you have two time points. Here we have an early time point and a late time point. So we're interested in seeing how gene expression is changing over time, and um, now we can make an enrichment map. That's basically two enrichment maps over on top of each other. So simple visualization technique: include uh, the early time point um, nodes are colored. The the score for the for the enrichment at the early time point is the color in the center of the node, and the score for the enrichment at the late time point is the the score at the borders of the node. So um, the um, so. If I'm thinking about two different time points, I might be interested in seeing a change between the two time points. So um, um, most of these, these pathways are not changing. They're red in the middle and they're red on the border, so or blue in the middle, blue in the border. So there's no big changes. But there's a few places here, like for instance here, there is a, um, um, if you can zoom in here, there's uh, pathways that are enriched early but then are not enriched late, and, and the opposite pattern here. So we can zoom in on those. In an, an enrichment map, if you happen to have gene expression data and you load it up, you can click on these nodes and you can see a heat map view like this. Um, it won't have these treated, untreated, but it will show you the actual heat map. And you can see that, um, indeed, these pathways, the genes in these pathways, are really different, differential at 12 hours, but at 24 hours they're, they're similar in experiment versus control. Similarly, these guys are, again, same in 12 hours, different in, in 24 hours. So if, when you look at your, this, is, this can be really, really interesting because when you cluster the whole data set, you might never see these little patterns. But certain pathways are really di acting differently. And you can zoom in on those and see really important big changes just with those pathways that may have been and very likely to have been hidden in a, when you look at all the genes together. Um, so the two, you know, um, two color. We call it a two color enrichment map. It's um, it's um, you know much better than having two tables and matching up all the, the, the themes. Um, let's see. Um, the uh, the third use case, the third and final use case, uh, is we, what we call query set analysis. 
So yesterday I was talking about how um, we'd like to explain the results that we see with some mechanistic interpretation. So in this case, this is a, kind of a trivial example because we kind of already knew the, 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 the regulator that's being tested. This is a, um, a paper that was published a few years ago where they knocked out a microRNA in the heart and uh, measured gene expression. So we did our, our normal um, GSEA analysis and enrichment map visualization and found that there's a whole bunch of pathways that go up and some pathways that go down when you remove the microRNA. That makes sense because a microRNA is a negative regulator and if you remove a re negative regulator like a you know holding a balloon, you let go of the balloon, a lot of things go up um, and most of the things are going up. So then we, we, um, we added one more gene set here which is the set of all microRNA targets that are predicted by a microRNA target prediction system um, called target scan and uh, and then enrichment map shows you the overlap um, just like the crosstalk between these pathways it shows you the overlap of this gene set to all these pathways and so you can see really nice strong links between this and vesicle trafficking and angiogenesis um, so those might be you know a lot of microRNA targets predicted microRNA targets are in these pathways some other pathways don't have significant overlap so this might tell you something about how um, uh, direct the regulation is of this microRNA to these pathways. No links to the pathways that are going down, which makes sense, again, because um, that's not an expected direct connection. Um, you can also do um, more, and this is in the integrated assignment, This, this more of this type of um, analysis. So if you didn't know the transcription factor that might explain why your pathways are going up and going down, you could try to search for it using a possum, um, and you guys talked about things like that yesterday. Um, and um, in this case, this is a, a, just an example uh, where Veronique did the analysis um, with, with Shahina in, in our group and um, uh, found a, um, a transcription factor that seemed to be uh, important, um, HIF1-alpha, um, in this particular experiment. So we had an enrichment map that we um, showed the targets of the transcription factors are highlighted. And so all these pathways here are, seem to be regulated by this transcription factor. Presumably, if we looked at uh, these other transcription factors, they may highlight different parts of this network. Um, I don't think we, I don't know if we ever ever did that. Did you did you look at the other transcription factors when, when you did this analysis and how they work with this? No, yeah, so, so I think that because the, it turned out that this transcription factor was really the, the important, the one most interesting one. Um, but presumably other transcription factors that are explaining the data might explain different parts of this pathway map. So I really like that, that idea because um, it starts helping you interpret these maps. So even though these maps are giving you nice visualization of the results um, that is very clear, it doesn't do the interpretation for you. Um, and you, you never get away from doing the interpretation. If the computer could do interpretation for you, it could do your homework, it could drive your car. Eventually it's going to be able to drive your car, but, you know, it's not, <laughs> turns out interpretation of scientific data is a lot more difficult than driving a car. So um, the, um, so that, we're not at that stage yet, so you really have to do, you, you know, these tools are really meant to help um, your interpretation. They're meant to de develop a number of hypotheses that can be tested um, and, and, uh, and that obviously that's useful. Um, here's the enrichment map that we made for autism, the paper. Um, it looks really nice because we made it, we, we updated it in Illustrator, so Illustrator just does a better job of, <laughs> of graphics. Um, and um, so yeah, as you can see, we, um, we added these bubbles, we added all these, these uh, various different types of bubbles. Um, we actually have two different types of enrichment, three different enrichment analyses that were done here. The circles are enrichment analysis that was done on the copy number variants. The triangles are enrichment analysis that was done on a list of dis intellectual disability genes, about a hundred of them. Um, and we also did the same thing on known autism genes, also about a hundred. So we had pathways that were, we're showing pathways that are enriched in known intellectual disability genes, pathways that are enriched in known autism genes, and these are parallelograms here. Um, and, and then pathways that are newly discovered in the enrichment of this 
of this copy number experiment. And then you can actually put those all together and see how they're related to each other. And interestingly, even though the pathways that were affected by the deletions and the copy number variants um, are, um, uh, even though they're pathways that are interesting in the central nervous system, they're not, they're not the same pathways that were exactly over, um, enriched in the intellectual disability genes, but actually they're really connected to each other with a lot of genes in common. So this really helped support the, the results because it connected functionally these new pathways to these existing known pathways. Um, the other things that we did here were um, custom using cytoscape visual mapping. We, we, vis we, we measured the um, um, false discovery rate of the enrichment of these um, as, a, as a color from white to red. Um, and um, yeah, so you can see how we kind of put a lot of things together that, we, that I just told you about today to make this nice figure. Here's a sort of zoom in. Um, yeah, so this just this is just some background on what that was. So this was uh, the pathway sources were all, all of gene ontology, CAG, NCI, and Reactome, and PFAM domains. Uh, this was the number of gene sets that were tested. Um, the paper is referenced. Um, the, the enrichment map um, app is um, really quite nice, so you'll get a chance to, to play with it later. Um, but it gives you a little slider, interactive slider bars that you can slide, and you can change the, the cutoffs uh, interactively for um, your FDR threshold, for instance, and your, um, your enrichment map will automatically update itself. So um, usually what I do when I look at this type of data is I play with these, um, these slider bars. I make them really stringent. Maybe we'll go over this more in the lab. I make them really stringent to see what the most the, the strongest signal is in the data, and then, um, and then that's useful to just know, okay, if I have anything, I have this really strong signal that's here, and obviously it should be a strong signal, it should, should have a good, a good FDR cutoff. Um, and then uh, gradually I, I, I expand it, and I see which functional themes pop up at different thresholds. Um, because a functional theme, what I call a functional theme is one of these modules, contains many pathways, uh, like many gene ontology biological process terms, um, some of them will be stronger than others. So I, 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 if any of them are strong, I consider that functional theme strong. Um, so that's, that's, um, that's useful. Um, this is just an a, a, a interesting idea about um, zooming in. So um, we have an enrichment map to summarize the data. We could find a region that's really interesting. And then one of these pathway nodes might be a pathway in Reactome. So you learn that you can go to Reactome and see the, the pathway. So you can actually go and overlay your gene expression data on that network using Reactome's website, and then notice that maybe a lot of the signal is not coming from the whole pathway, but maybe just a, a particular complex here. So that's how we zoom in and drill down to more detailed information. Um, we, um, we use GSEA. Uh, yes, you learned about GSEA yesterday. We have a collaboration with GSEA, so Enrichment Map is actually going to be part of a future version of GSEA, so you'll just be able to create these directly from GSEA. It makes it easier. Um, we'll try this Word, map, Word Cloud plugin in um, the afternoon uh, later, later, but um, this is a, an interesting um, tool that helps uh, summarize uh, all of the pathway information that's here. So I can select a set of nodes in Cytoscape, and then I get a little word cloud. Uh, you often see these on the internet to kind of uh, summarize a lot of text. Uh, words that appear frequently are drawn bigger, um, and so you can just get so another just tool to help you quickly uh, see what's going on in a given cluster or module. Um, and this is a, a word, uh, an inertia map cookie that Ruth Isserlin, who programmed um, uh, in Richard Map, um, she got really excited about the project, and so she, when it was her turn to present in lab meeting, she baked a, she baked it into a cookie. So, I can tell you that in, this is my my old joke that Richard Maps are not only useful, they're 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 tasty. So, um, okay, so the Richard Map lab will do after the break, um, and the goal will be to try out in Richard Map. Um, there will be uh, try, time to load G profiler results. Um, GSEA analysis results from the tutorial online. Um, you can use the results from the integrated assignment, which is not liver anymore. That was from last year, and that's updated. And the um, uh, and there's there's a bunch of tutorials, and ideally you could try it with your own data as well. So um, 
Okay, any questions?